So we've been following uh, Paul's argument around law and grace for some time now, just reminding us where we've traveled so far with Paul. Beginning uh, four weeks ago, we talked about law, uh, we talked about the freedom that is ours in Christ coming at great cost, not just to Jesus, but also to Paul, who almost lost his life delivering this message of freedom in Christ to the people in the region of Galatia. In the second week, we talked a little bit about how this message of freedom uh, enables us and encourages us to dig deep wells, wells from which life can flow, as opposed to fences and boundary markers that exclude and keep some people out while letting other people feel comfortable like they are God's uh, amazing and only chosen ones. Instead of being fence builders, Paul invited us to be well diggers, people who create a source of life that all may come to. The third week, we talked about how those boundaries that we acquire throughout our lives, sometimes through the norms and regulations of a religious community, sometimes through the norms and regulations of a family or of a nation or of some other group, or sometimes the, the boundaries that, that we set up, the fences that we build, the walls that we build because of woundedness and pain and injury in our lives. But the only way across those boundaries, the only way to break those walls down is to let go of them and instead allow the life of Christ to live through us, the life of the one who came for all, the life of the one who loves all. That is the only way we can get to the other side. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives in this, but Christ who lives in me with all. And then last week, we talked about how Paul had to discover this message of grace somewhere within his own tradition, within the tradition of the Old Testament, because he did not have any Gospels, he did not have any of his letters, much less anybody else's, to draw upon, because that was not his scripture. The only scripture he had at this point in time was the Old Testament. And so he looked, he looked into that, and he searched until he found the antecedent to the law, God's promise to Abraham. Abraham, who lived some 430 or more years before the law even came into existence through Moses. And he saw in Abraham one who was brought into the fullness of life in God, not through obedience to a set of laws, but by trusting by faith, and by the grace that comes through faith. So today, Paul picks up the question, well, then, if the law doesn't lead to life, why did we get it anyway? What was the purpose of the law? What role did it play in this grand drama of salvation for humanity? And he pulls two examples from the daily life and knowledge of the people to try and help explain the situation. The first thing that he draws upon is the experience or the example of a will, a last will and testament. Um, it, it's translated in our NIV version as covenant, but it's really testament or will, like you would write up to dispose of your property when you're dead, right? And once you have signed that and sealed it with a notary seal, it is not changeable, right? You, you can change it, only you can change it, but unless you change it, it's going to be that way. Paul takes that example and he says, God made a pact. God gave a final will and testament to Abraham, a promise that could not be broken, a promise that must be sustained. And so when the law comes, it's not like it pushes Abraham's promise out of the way and displaces it. No, the promise is secure. And that promise was made to Abraham and his descendant, singular, which is kind of an interesting thing because wasn't Abraham supposed to be a blessing to bless all families? Yes, 
Well, how is that going to happen? Was it just going to be his, uh, his progeny, his, the seed from his body, his own children? No. What Paul says is that the, the seed that is anticipated, the descendant that is anticipated, is Christ. And that it is in Christ, then, that all of humanity is able to be gathered up and brought into this experience of God's love and favor. It is through Christ that we understand the truth about who all of us already are, that we are children of God, that we belong to God, that God's love is ours, that there is nothing that can take us out of that love. It is in Christ that we discover that we are brought into that. And that is what Paul wants to affirm in the text we read today. Now, this is one of those texts where you get a hold of it and you read it through and you're like, what? What is he saying? I can't follow the argument. And so I'm going to unpack it a little bit at a time for us so that we can kind of understand where he goes. So the first thing he's saying is this promise given by God is like a final will and testament. It can't be changed. So the law that comes later must have some other function. It's not taking away the promise of full, abundant life in God by faith, by trust. It's got to have a different role. And this is when he pulls from another example from that time, something that we don't necessarily understand or do today. A Pythagogo. Anybody know what a Pythagogo is? Pedagogo comes from the same word that we get pedagogy, or a way of learning, right? A, a way to teach. A pedagogo was the slave in a household who was responsible for taking care of the children from their infancy until their age of majority, when they become responsible. The pedagogo had two principal responsibilities, to protect the kids from getting into trouble, and to discipline them when they did. <laughs> so there was two roles for the Pythagogo to play. To help reinforce where the right path was or where the boundary lines were for the kids so that they didn't go past them. And then to bring some consequences to bear if they decided they were going to push those boundaries. Paul says, the law, the law is our Pythagogo. The law is our pedagogy. The law is the one who plays the role of showing us where the boundary lines are for behavior that is for our good. But it also plays the role of laying down some consequences when we go across that. The law takes humanity during this period of time from Moses to Jesus and gives us some protection and creates some discipline for us. Now, Peace Camp, we've been doing Peace Camp for two weeks now, it's all in my brain, so all my illustrations today are gonna to come from Peace Camp, right? So, when we go out, uh, well, when we organize Peace Camp, part of what we do is we have counselors who are like in charge of different activity areas, and then we have junior counselors who help herd uh, the, the younger children around. And their job is to keep them safe. They're to be pedagogos for these kids while they're in peace camp, to make sure they don't go into the street and get hit by a car, to make sure they don't run behind the archery area when we're shooting bow and arrow and get an arrow in the side of their belly or something, to make sure that they abide by the limits that are there for their good. That's what a Pythagogo is supposed to be. So some of you guys are Pythagogos today. You didn't know that. But for the last two weeks, you've been Pythagogos. When we go to the river, which is really pretty high right now on Fridays, we create a perimeter in the area of the river that's safe for the kids to swim in. And the people who create that perimeter have the job of making sure the kids stay within the perimeter so they don't get carried away by the current and swept off to their death. Pythagogos, you create a barrier that's there for the good of the ones who you're protecting. 
Now, Paul was dealing with the use of the law in the Jewish community and in the Christian, the newly emerging Christian community, not as a protector, but as a rigid judgment a vehicle that was used to keep some people in power and to keep others out. A vehicle that was used to elevate the self-righteousness of some while to emphasize the sinfulness of others. And 1,500 years later, the Protestant Reformation took up these same texts because it was dealing with a church that had become similar in many ways to the same kinds of issues that were happening within the Jewish community in Paul's day. When the church uses its power and its paedagogo legal boundaries to destroy life rather than encourage life, to impose oppressively upon people instead of to nurture health and vitality for people, then there is a problem. The law has lost its purpose. And for Martin Luther and for John Calvin, they had to think again about what the right role of the rules and regulations within the life of the church should be. And so they looked at this passage from Paul because they looked at the church at that time and they said, we've got a problem. The rules and regulations of the church are being used to extract money from people without giving them life. It's being used to keep some people very powerful while others are being kept very, very without power. Powerless. And so they said, what is the right use of the law? What is the proper use of the law? What's the intention of the law? And they go back to Paul and they pull these same terms out. Martin Luther came up with two things. The way he described it is he said the law exists for two fundamental reasons. It exists to restrain evil in the world, that is to say, to help limit the amount of badness that is coming out of human beings. Right? If you know that you're supposed to only go you know, 50 miles an hour on a road, there are a lot of people who only go 50 miles an hour on the road. But there are also quite a few who don't. <laughs> so it's a limit. It restrains some folks, but it doesn't restrain everybody. And so the second function of the law is to make clear to us what rebellious binglings we are. In Paul's words, how sinful we are. That we always are pushing the limits. That we're always wanting to do what we want to do, whether it's good for us or not. And so the law for Luther had these two functions. It, it restrains evil and it reveals our need for forgiveness and our need transformation. John Calvin had a little argument with Martin Luther about this, and he said there's actually one other function that the law provides. The, the law also provides the function of showing us the way we should do things. It has an instructive function, not just a restricting and a castigating or, or disciplinary function, but it also has a positive training function. Like the Pedagogo, who would help lead the kids in what they should do and how to deal with things. So let's let's bring this home a little bit. Two weeks ago, I talked to you about how the millennial generation, those kids who were born somewhere between 1985 and 2010, and are maturing now. How the millennial generation looks at the church today, our church today, the church today, and instead of seeing 
the church function in that careful nurturing of life way that unfolds a generous grace. The church is seen as that group of people who are against everything, it seems. The church is seen as a community of people who only enforce the limits in order to bring judgment and condemnation on other people. How the church is seen as that community of people that is unwilling and unable to change. And they have very little interest in being a part of a community like that. Just like Paul had very little interest in being part of a community that insisted on circumcision for every single Greek or Roman that wanted to be part of the community. Just like Martin Luther and John Calvin refused to be part of a church community that made people buy their way into salvation. Today, the millennial generation is looking at us and going, I don't think so. I think grace is bigger than that. I think grace is wider than that. I think grace is deeper than that. I think God's got a bigger heart than just a heart for Presbyterians or for Protestants or for Catholics or for Jews or for Muslims. As uh, as Servando walked into his class today, he stepped right into my sermons. He uh, handed me a comment from the New Yorker. And it's a picture of God standing on a cloud with an angel having a conversation looking at the earth. And this is what God says to the angel. I'm really starting to prefer the ones who don't believe in me. I'm really starting to prefer the ones who don't believe in me. Why? Because all of the true believers can do nothing but fight with each other over who is right and who is wrong. The grace that Paul invites us to, the invitation that Paul extends to us is is that the law was there to show us how much we needed something bigger, something broader, something deeper, something fuller. Because if the law is all we have, we will end up at each other's throats. We will end up using that law to crush one another, to exploit one another, to take advantage of one another instead of using it to show us how much we need grace and forgiveness. So it is that he comes to the conclusion of his conversation in the third chapter with these words. You are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ and have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, no dividing wall. There is neither slave nor free, no dividing wall. There is neither male nor female, no dividing wall. For you are one in Christ Jesus. It's possible to even take that verse and turn it into something exclusionary. And many Christians have done so. Unless you pray this prayer and ask the Lord Jesus into your heart today, you will burn in hell for the rest of eternity. You must be in Christ Jesus and I'll show you how to get in Christ Jesus. It's the way we say. But that is not Paul's message. What he's saying to us is that in Christ Jesus, God has gathered up all of humanity and made clear that that is God's intention, to bless all families of the earth, as was promised to Abraham. Our role 
is not to be the gatekeepers of who's in and who's out. Our role is to reveal and to demonstrate in our way of life, in the generosity of our life with one another, to demonstrate that everyone belongs, that we already belong, that there is already love poured over us, that we are already beloved of God, that there is nothing that can take us out of that belovedness. And we know that because Jesus is the one who showed it to us, and he is the one who was raised up beyond death. For God to say, yeah, just like him, that's how we need to be. It is possible even to take a generous passage like that. No longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free, no longer man or woman, no longer Mexican or American, no longer black or white, no longer Muslim or Christian. You are one because Christ Jesus has made clear you are one. That's a generous grace. In fact, it's so generous that some people just can't tolerate it. And so it is that God prefers, perhaps, those who don't believe in him today. Because it seems that all those who claim to believe in God can only be the ones who believe just like and that's not how we live. At least, that's not how Paul said it. That's not how I see it. And I hope that's not how you see it. Let's pray. Amoroso Dios, gracias por tu gracia tan generosa que se extiende a nosotros en una forma gratuita que solo anticipa nuestra confianza para darnos cuenta de lo que ya es la realidad. Permítanos ser una comunidad no que procura dejar entrar unos y excluir a otros, sino que procura ser tan generosa en su forma de ser que todo el mundo descubrirá aquí fuente de vida, fuente de amor, fuente de perdón y de gracia. En tu nombre te lo